thank you all for coming, and yes, what they said. <laughs> I've got to talk to Anwar about what I did to make him mad enough to make me always go last. Uh, we've got to rearrange this somehow. Well, let me raise a couple of other issues with you. Um, one issue is that we is expect in the banking sector, U.S. banking sector, that there's probably about $3.1 trillion in what are called toxic assets. That is assets, paper, that is not worth the underlying support. We've acknowledged so far about $1.3 trillion. So we have a ways to go. Now, we have probably absorbed already most of the subprime mortgages. We're, that's pretty much done. What is happening now are commercial loans, credit cards, all the things that happen in a recession, normal mortgages, are beginning to show weakness. So these are good, solid borrowers. These are not the ones that people um, heinously like to refer to as the subprime. And uh, it's one of those issues that you need to kind of think a little bit about in the sense that this is not new. We do this frequently. I mean, every 10, 15 years, we have to have a crisis. Now, one of the things that happens in a crisis is obviously some people get severely hurt, and the losses we've seen in paper assets have been pretty severe, but it's also how we learn. How do you learn what works and doesn't work if you don't try? Um, as a young man, I used to be very deeply involved in motorcycle racing, and um, we always used to laugh, you don't know how fast you can go until you fall off. Well, that's pretty much what's been happening. We tried some things um, for a variety of reasons. They failed. There are two reasons, without getting too philosophical about it. One is what they call confirmation bias. Confirmation bias means that when you look for facts, you only look for the ones that support your predetermined position. You're not really looking for facts. You're looking for a specific set of facts. So what happened was, as all this expansion took hold, literally from 1997 through 2006, housing prices nationwide in the U.S. went up 124%. That's more than double. Now, it's not an Amarillo. We have not gone up 124% between 97 and 2006. There's a very good reason. Any of you who stepped outside the door last Saturday know the reason. <laughs> you don't come here unless you're coerced. <laughs> Truly. you got to have family or job. And then after you're here for a while, you say, this is okay. You stay indoors on Saturday. And you say, my God, there went the field. And I wonder where it'll land. But what I'm saying is we never saw the run-up of 124%, so we didn't see the declines. You know, that's a good thing on the downside. Of course, on the upside, all of us were kind of upset. We're all looking around saying, geez, I wish we had some facts that would confirm the fact that the California people were smart. The next bias is what they call superiority bias, and that is um, you always think you're smarter than the other guy. Now, last year when we spoke, I referred to it as numerical tyranny, and what I mean by that is people who can flip statistics around better than you can typically scare the hell out of you. You don't want to look stupid by going, what was that in real words? Because they're saying, you know, they are squared, and, and the subsumption of this, if you take the square root of that, and you were going, oh, okay, yeah, right. That's superiority bias. Right? And we had a lot of that going on. Many of the securitization products were developed by people who are PhDs out of MIT at all, who have never, ever made a loan, bought a house, run a business. They're mathematicians. If the formula works, the formula works. And I'm not going to tell him it doesn't work because he has a PhD in math from MIT, and I don't. And I'm looking at it going, okay, that, that's got to work. I mean, my God, look at the math in that thing. And it turned out it didn't. 
to give you some numbers relative to what Pat said about Amarillo down 3%. Last two years, Miami's down 38.9. Phoenix is down 31%. These are two-year numbers. Vegas is down 48%. They have fallen from a median price of 288 to 150. San Diego, which came late to the party, is already down 35% and trying to take the lead. San Francisco didn't get in on the game until about a year ago. It's dropped over 35% in one year. Not two years, one year. If you put 20% down in 2006, you are underwater. You're not a subprime borrower. You're not some slime ball, no dock, low dock. You put 20% down, you had a job, and you are now have a mortgage that is 20% higher than the value of your house. It's awfully tempting to say, I could live in this same house for 20% less by picking up my couch and going across the street. And that's what we're seeing. <coughs> the only way out of this is you have to work the inventory off. Now, we have very low mortgage rates. We have seen a vast amount of refinancing. Actually, new home sales are starting to come up a little bit. Why? Because the rates went down, and some people are figuring, this is pretty cheap. If I get into Las Vegas at half of what it cost me two years ago, and I want to be there, this might be the time. But it will take a while to work all of that off. Now, there's a large overhang of that unsold property out there that has to work itself off. That gets us into the world of how did we get into the mess AIG at all. What we did with the subprime loans is we packaged them up and we securitized them. We've been securitizing for years. All right? Mortgage-backed securities are very familiar. Believe me, any of you who own a home, you would not own it if we did not have mortgage-backed securities. Guarantee it. In the old days when all we had was the SNL, you had to wait till everybody paid off before there was enough cash to make the next loan. They only loaned at the rate at which they collected. So you got on the list and you waited your turn. Now we go down and say, I have A1 credit. You know, I'm sitting around a 780 and 800. I got good numbers. I want to buy this house. Here's my 20%. And we fully expect, okay, here's your mortgage. You can't have that without securitization. You've got to be able to convert the mortgages you hold into cash to make new ones. And we've done it for years. What happened was with the subprime, we started packaging them up and putting them into the market, not really comprehending just how risky they were. The people who bought the securities, they're saying, well, it's a mortgage-backed security. I've bought those before. And besides, it's backed by some kind of a credit default swap, typically issued by AIG. Now, a credit default swap is a simple-minded instrument for those of you who have ever looked at options. It is a naked put. That is, a put is the right for you to sell something back to somebody at a specified price. If I sell you that right, and for a premium, I have written a naked put. I don't own the underlying asset. I've just said, I think the price will go up, not down. You'll never exercise it. I'm going to keep the premium. What AIG did with the credit default swaps is they sold over $400 million worth of those. And they had huge fee-based income. Now you say, now why would you do that? Well, because remember, from 1997 to 2006, house prices went up 124%. Even if I take back the house, I can sell it for a higher price. Nobody saw house prices collapsing the way they did beginning in 06, 07. It's why we are now still already 18 months into a recession, and it's likely to continue. But most of those subprimes are out of the game now. What we're now concerned with is how deep will it get in terms of the recession on normal mortgages, normal commercial loans, and credit cards. Granted, people are beginning to pay off at the consumer level, but at the corporate level, we've got to keep those flows of funds working.
you can't do business without financing. You just can't. It just cash only won't work. You are then limited solely to your internally generated funds. So basically what happens is in a situation like this, to, to work our way out of it is not going to be easy, it's not going to be fast, because it's underlying things that have to work out. I.e., we've got to get the housing market stable, which means we've got to start buying up that excess. We've got to get enough people back into the market, buying homes, at least the price is flattened out, and hopefully start going back up a little bit. That then creates that feeling, okay, I've got a little money, and things are getting better. Maybe I could go ahead and pay for something. Maybe I could go ahead and buy a few things. And we start slowly stimulating the economy. I did read a piece last night, and then I'll conclude. Um, in Germany, they are paying you in euros, but the equivalent of $4,000 if you'll dump your eight-year-old car off at the junkyard and go buy a new one. That is being bandied about for the U.S. The number is $8,000 that I'm seeing. We'll pay you eight grand to take your clunker as a voucher if you drop it off and let them crush it and then go buy something new as a way to artificially stimulate the auto industry. And you've got to think that one through. There are a lot of interesting issues in there. Um, number one, if you are a collector car enthusiast, as I happen to be, that pretty much put the end to your world. Because you don't know right now which are the current eight-year-old cars are going to become collector cars until 25 years from now. By that point, they're all about that thick. Which is it's going to be really tough to do a restoration on. You know, it's going to take a while. The other issue is it's just, in effect, government largesse through the back door. In effect, we're paying the people to go buy cars. We could just as easily give the money other than the fact you wouldn't have production. But more critically, what do you do to all the mechanics that are keeping all those old cars running? And what do you do to all the parts houses that sell the parts to keep all those old cars running? What I'm saying is we come up with a lot of these short-term solutions. As you think them through, think about the ripple effects globally. And you start saying, well, maybe that's not the answer. Maybe we get out of this one like we always get out of it. We suffer for a while, and we slowly crawl our way out, and five years from now we look back and say, okay, which of that era, what pieces do we hang on to, and what do we promise never to go do again? Because that's how we learn. That's how we make progress. Um, I don't know how else to do it. None of us have the superior saying, well, here's the next invention. We invent by trying things out. Who among you can say every single new idea, 100% of the time, should always work? Answer, nobody. We say if you can bat 50% plus one, you're winning. Well, why is it different in finance? And the answer is it's not. It, it's a painful way to do it. Probably not the most logically efficient way to do it. I don't know another one that is even remotely free market. So. My message to most of the young people, hang on, it's going to be a little bit of a rocky ride for a while. We're going to come out of this. Remember the books. I'll tell you, 15, 20 years from now, we're going to do it again. I just don't know what it will look like. But we will be back. It is just the nature of the animal. Uh, one other book, of, in addition to the one that Anwar mentioned, there is a book that was written in the 1800s by Frederick Macklin called Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. And it's all about the South Sea Bubble and the tulip craze. Read it and think about the housing craze up through 2006. And then just substitute the word tulip for house. <laughs> and you got to go, you know, we've been here before. It just is the way in which we behave. You know, and, and I don't know that there's a better way. I wish I could say that all this pain was unnecessary. I'm not sure it is. Maybe that's how we make progress in our kind of economy. People in more structured economies make progress in other ways, but this is how ours works. I will turn
turn it over to you and ask them questions or the smart guys.